For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. This is a parable about what? Huh? What's this a parable about? He tells you in verse, 20, in verse 1, he tells you what the parable is about. Uh, it's about the kingdom of God. Right? Look at verse 1. Now, he's going to use the parable, he's going to use employment to teach it. But see, look what it says in verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven, Right? That's the spiritual kingdom, isn't it? That's the kingdom that he rules over. For the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven is like. Now he's going to give a parable, and it's going to involve employment. He's going to use, now what he's going to do is he's going to talk about employment from a biblical standpoint. He's going to show you the truth about employment. He's not going to teach you lies and then tell you believe that for the kingdom, right? <laughs> So what he's teaching about employment here is very important to us because he's giving you the absolute truth, not the way it is necessarily, but the way it ought to be. Because he's, he's using this parable that he's teaching uh, about the kingdom of heaven, right? The kingdom of heaven, what's this about? Now, I'm going to teach a lot about employment tonight, right? But remember, this is a parable about... now. What, let me tell you, there are, I could get really complicated about what a parable is. So let me just get simple with it. A parable is an earthly story, a, tr a true, with reality, truth reality. It is an earthly story of truth with a heavenly meaning. In other words, it has a meaning to it. He's going to take a human illustration that's true, and, and make a, a spiritual point about the kingdom of God. Now, the other thing about a parable, this is somewhere on your paper, probably in my introduction, okay? The other thing is, always remember this about a parable. No matter how many people are in it, no matter how many things are in it, it's only about one point. One spiritual point. Always. For example, let me give one that everybody's really familiar. You remember the parable of the four grounds? The sower went out to sow. You remember that? There's only one, only one point in that. There's only one point in that. And it's the good ground. And you remember the four, the four grounds were about different hearers. It was a kingdom of God parable. All the parables about the kingdom of God. It was a parable of the kingdom of God about, about the people who have the opportunity to hear the word of the kingdom and how they di react differently to it, right? But the one point was, is the good ground, right? Always. So don't, don't get distracted by all the... De now, today we're going to have work. We're going to have um, wages. We're going to have work and wages. There's going to be five shifts you, you know, when I say work shifts, you know, all right? Well, they're going to have five work shifts. So often people get all distracted by all this stuff that's going on and don't pay any attention. I don't care how much is going on. There's only one point, right? So let me get right to the point. Go to verse 16. Because once we lay verse 1... We don't get the point until we get to verse 16. So I want you to get the point before you get the lesson. Otherwise, you'll miss it. Are you with me? This whole parable is about the kingdom of heaven. Agreed? Or the kingdom of God. And here's the point. There's only, remember, it's a parable. Therefore, there's only one spiritual point. And it's stated in verse 16. 
Thus the last shall be first and the first shall be last. Now, this is not the first time Jesus taught this, is it? I mean, he's taught this several times to his disciples. They were always wanting to be the first. And he said, mm, I'm first. You guys have got to figure out how you get there, how, how you get promoted in the kingdom. Say, the last shall be first, and the first last. See, it's about how you get promoted. Do you see what I mean? See, you got to learn that about the kingdom. Well, I was here first. Well, I did this most and I did that most. Uh-uh. It's a grace principle. See, in the human realm, it's who gets there first. It's who does this and who does that. Not in the kingdom. It's who, it's who, it's who God lets, it's who Let's God do grace. It's not about works. It's, listen, if it's about works, then the first would be first. The second would be second. The third would be third. You get the gold medal if you come in first. You don't get it if you come in last. <laughs> but he said, you do. How is that possible? Grace, not works. Agreed? Grace is what puts you at the head of the line, not works. For the world, it's works put you first. In the kingdom of God, it's grace that puts you first. Never forget this. It is the great point of this parable. And that's God's system. It's called the kingdom of God. Not the kingdom of this world. This is called the kingdom of God. Aren't you glad you came tonight? Now we're going to show you how he used this parable of employment to teach this principle. Because that's what we're after, isn't it? Right? All right. Pay attention to five shifts. Here we go. The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius, that's a one day's wage. That was the going rate of one day. A denarius was a one was a going rate for a good rate. All right? Not talking about low wages, I'm talking about average wage was a denarius for a day's work. That was a livelihood. They paid, them, they paid their workers every day. It's not once a week, not twice a month. They paid them every day because these people had to go home and get groceries. They weren't going to eat it. They did. Okay. When they agreed, and when they had agreed, that, that is contracted, the labor and management, labor, employee, employ, employer, and when he had agreed with the laborers for denarius for the day, he sent them into the vineyard. The vineyard. We'll talk about the vineyard in a little bit. The vineyard in Israel still is a phenomenal market. The vineyard in Israel. It goes all the way back. The vineyards in Israel goes all the way back to, to Noah and goes back to the Andes because he brought it over on the boat. It goes all the way back to the Andaluvian world before the flood. The wine's been around a long time. I might tell you, wine's been around a long time. There is a little drinking place and one that you can close. That little drinking place is on your face and just beneath your nose. That's, that's, how, you deal, that's how you deal with alcohol right there. Aunt, Aunt Bice taught me that. As a young preacher, and I... I never forgot that lesson. And he went out about the third hour, second shift. The first shift was 6 a.m. The second shift, he goes out to the, on the second shift, he hires more for the second shift. The third hour, that's 9 a.m. He went out 6 a.m. for the first shift, went out 9 a.m. for the second shift. And he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. We still hire people that way, don't we, who want to work? 
Every community's got a place to pick these people up, haven't they? Um, and those, and uh, let's see, the marketplace. And to those, he said, go into any, he, they contracted out with him the same way. You should go to in the vineyard, uh, and whatever's right, I will give you. And so they went. Uh, again, he goes out on the sixth hour, that's noon, and we got third shift, and the ninth hour, right? Ninth hour, and did the same thing. Then, and now we got four shifts. Now about the 11th hour, and there's 12 hours in a working day. You work from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And they got off easy. As a farm kid, I worked from sun up to sun down, and sometimes that sun looked like it'd never go down. <laughs> right? Boy, sometimes that thing would never go down. We didn't quit till that sun was gone. Well, anyhow. Uh, so they worked a 12-hour shift. They worked 12 hours. Now they got five shifts. You understand that? Went out and hired five times. Got five shifts running. Uh, and he hires, he hired, the fifth shift is our, and they found others standing. They're uh, all, all wanting to work. And he said to them, why have you been standing out here idle all day long? And they said, because no one will hire us. And he said to them, well, go, you too go to the vineyard. So when evening came, which is, tw right, now they've worked at 12, we're at 6 p.m. And when the evening comes, 6 p.m., the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages. Everybody was contracted to get a denarius for a day's wage. You know why? Because this owner, listen, they had the winery in Israel has from August and September to get that stuff in and out of that field or it's no good. They got to get it, right? And some of it is grapes and the rest is raisins and some of it's juice and some of it's wine. Right? I mean, that's the product. And you've got that, you've got a short window and if you know anything about growing anything that's edible, you got to get it a certain time and get it out of there or it, it just gets in all kinds of trouble. All right? So this... He's got to have five shifts because he's got to get that produce in. He's got to get it picked and brought in and, and ready for market. That's why he's doing what he's doing. Um, and when those hired first came, they thought that they would receive more. And they also received each one a denarius. Well, they, that was the contract. Every shift had this contract. They all contracted every shift out of the generosity of the owner because he needs to get his product off the field and into the market. He's willing to pay more to get that done. I mean, as a farm kid, and we did this all the time. We did this all the time. You had to get them cherries off those trees. You couldn't leave them for the birds. <laughs> You couldn't leave them to fall. They couldn't, you could not afford to have them fall. Well, anyhow, and when they received it, they grumbled at the landowner. The guy, the guy that came in and worked the 12 hours, he got a denarius. The guy who came in and worked one hour got a denarius. They're upset. Right? They're upset. They shouldn't be. Why? Why should they... Why should they not be upset. Because they contracted. They wanted a day's wage. They were willing to work. Every shift had to sign a contract that the owner was willing to pay to get that crop out of the field and into the marketplace. Right? Because it was a fair wage anyway. What was it? Yes, it was a very good fair wage. But that's not the point, is it? No, as far as the complainers, I've done the work. Yeah, but... Listen, work has wages. Yes, but I worked 12 and got a denarius. He worked one and got it. That's not fair. You know what's fair? The contract. That's what's fair is the contract. The contract. Well, here's what he answered. Verse 12. These last men have worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the scorching heat of the day. Yeah, that's because that's what work is. Thorns and thistles, sweat of the brow. You're going to work it till you die. 
And then you're going to return to the ground. Right? This is the name of the game. You know why? Adam's sin. Adam's sin put the curse on the earth and put it on employment. That's Genesis 3, 17 through 19. But he answered and said to, to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for Demarius? A denarius? Look, did we not contract ourselves out? Did I not give you a fair wage for... Yeah, but listen. He only worked... I mean, we got five shifts. Yeah, but he only worked... You gave him the same amount. This is what he said. Take what is yours and go your way. But I wish to give you... But I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. I desire to do that. I got to get the product. Listen, I realize you don't care if the product gets out of the field. But I do, because that's my livelihood. Getting the crop out of the field is your livelihood, and getting it to the market is where my livelihood is. I didn't take it out of your wages. I took it out of mine. Now listen to that. Do you get that? I didn't take it out of your wages. Out of mine. Would you agree with that? He took it out of his profit. Because he needed, he's not going to have a profit if he doesn't get that out of the field and into the market. All right? But see, this is what his disciples were fussing about all the time. You seem to prefer him more than you prefer me. And I do this and I don't get that. And yet, 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 yet. See, this is what he's saying to his disciples because this parable is about what? This parable is about what? The kingdom of God. And the point of this parable is what? Last will be first in the kingdom. In the kingdom, the last will be first. Why? Because you're treated, listen, you're treated equal in the kingdom. And how God wants to be generous is his business, not yours. He will always give you equitable because in Christ we're equal. But how that measures out in your life is depending on the goodness of God. And not about, listen, it's not based on your character or your work. Well, I ought to get more because I worked more. I worked harder. I've been in the heat all day. I know. And I'm appreciative of that. And there's your wages. Is it, listen verse 15, is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with what is my own? Listen, where is he getting the money? Is he, get, is he taking it from the employees to pay these others that? No, he's taking it from his profit. I'm taking it out of my pocket. You understand? Why? I got to get that out of the field and into the marketplace for me to have a livelihood. I've put all my livelihood at risk. That's entrepreneurship. You put yours at risk. So in verse 15, is it lawful for me to do what I wish with what is my own? Or, or listen, watch, he nails their problem. Or is it your eye, or is your eye envious because I am generous? And let me tell you, the only people that feel that way are legalists. And he got them. His disciples following him that he's about to leave the kingdom with are, are legalistic in the way they think and not grace-oriented. Let me tell you, you'll... If you're going to work in the kingdom, you need to work on grace bases, not on wage bases. And when you get your wages, don't complain. Is it possible when you're working here on earth, aren't you also working under the same situation as man? Yeah, in employment. You don't work for man. That's true. As a believer... That's true, isn't it? Whatever you do, do is unto the Lord. You know that Colossians 3.23? Yeah. Give that 100%, 110% or whatever it is. Now, 
Notice under point one, I got three points. Notice under point one. See, see look, you could get distracted with five shifts. Every, I mean, we had all the people coming and going, and we got crops coming in, barns being filled, and we could get all distracted by that. But see, this, this has got a singular message, doesn't it? Right? Remember that. Notice under point one, I, I broke the parable down into uh, six hierarchical points uh, for, later for you to look at. The work contract. Now, these things are very important to your life as an employee. You need to have a work contract. And in that work contract, it's, it should, you should have a job description. What, what, are, what, what are you expecting me to do uh, <clears throat> for my pay? What do you want me to do and what are you paying me? And let's talk about that. And look, you're not going to, don't be hiring me. Listen, that's why you got to have a job description contract. If you have to write it and him sign it, you got to have one. Otherwise, along the, along the way, if you don't have, he changes, he changes the rules on you. And he keeps adding work to you and don't pay you anymore. Wants you to do this and wants you to do that, and you already contracted it. Now, you, you've got, you, now, now he's into your livelihood. He's into your paycheck. So you, you need to have a contract. If you have to write it out on toilet paper and sign it, I don't care. You need a contract, and and it need, you need you need to know in your heart this is what and the, this is employment. And this is the way it should be. You should have contract. Is there should be a description of what I'm doing and what pay I'm supposed to get and anything else that you want to no negotiate, health care benefit whatever it is. It's got to be negotiated. <clears throat> the contract, okay. But let me, let, me, let me point out something that you're missing in this. Who went out? Who went out to get the labor? Who created the jobs and who went out to get the people to fill the jobs? The owner. Did the unions do it? No. The unions never do it. Why would we give them any money? They give us nothing. They give us nothing. I can write my own contract. I can, I can negotiate my own contract. Why would we? Listen, if this, if this union, I paid them a little bit and guaranteed that if I lost my job, they would be able to keep my, keep my keep, they had another policy to float over me and help me get a job, I might consider giving them a little bit. This person isn't doing me anything. What am I paying him money for? There ain't no help in that. That's crazy stuff. Look, the employer is who's motivated to hire people because he's got a crop. He's got to get it. He's motivated to get the person to labor, get that labor out there. Listen, there's two people that don't help you get a job out there that, that want, want, uh, want you to give them a portion of what you're working for, government and unions. And listen, the one person you need, you don't need either one of them. The one person you do need is God. Because God created everything, and without him, everything created is worth nothing. Okay. <laughs> he was out looking for people to hire, man. Nobody else was out there. There was nobody. Everybody else you're paying is not out there looking for it. He's looking for people to pay them. Well, anyhow. Five shifts. Worker hired five shifts. Why? Got a product. Got to get out of the field and get into the market. They have a, a window, a production window. This is all, this, everybody knows this. Then wages paid. A denarius contracted to end of a day's work. Why? Livelihood. Free enterprises where jobs are, free enterprise. That's where, the, that's where jobs are. You know why? Because that's where, listen, there, that's what creates livelihood. You can be your own, entrepre own entrepreneur. You can create a job and do it. My people were farmers. That's what we did. We farmed. And those... That though some of them left the farm and got into the restaurant business because they understood food. They knew how to get it. They knew how to get food. They just naturally went from the farm to the restaurant because they had all that they understood. 
But livelihood, it's all about livelihood. Employment, God set up employment as a divine institution for the livelihood of man. God set it up, not man, not government. <laughs> Wage disputes. Listen, you always have it, complaints about this and about that. Listen, you need to resolve your own. You don't need somebody to talk on your behalf. I, mean, they, I don't see them working besides me, carrying no load. Go talk to your, this, you're the most, listen, if you're worth something, that guy's going to keep you. If you're able to get the crop from there to the market, that guy's going to keep you. It's about the bottom line. I mean, he's working for the same thing you are, livelihood. He just may have a bigger house, but livelihood. The reason he's got a bigger house, he's got more debt. It's the only reason. Then, and so you, you need to understand that. Let, here's a place where government is good. Government is good when you have contracts. You, 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 have to, you may need the government to be able to do the contracts and the legal business. The one guy you need on your team is probably a good lawyer. As bad as that is, it's a lawyer, right? Because if you have a labor dispute, you might be able to resolve it within a governmental structure, but the odds are you're going to have to get a lawyer. If, that, if push comes to shove, that's what we do. So, you know, the guy goes like, look, if... And then wealth distribution. Look where wealth dis dis distribution is. I mean, you see this word, I envious? That's actually the word poneros. That word envious is actually evil. This is actually evil versus good. Generosity is good. This is poneros versus um, agathos. This is evil of the world versus the goodness of God. Actually, that's what that, that is in your Greek text. When it, says, uh, when it says, is your eye envious because I am generous, it means, is your eye evil? Are you seeing, are, have you bought into evil rather than God's goodness? How is it you've missed God's goodness? Well, and so, and then the wisdom of the parable is, what's the point of this whole thing? We've studied all this, so what's the point? Now, I mentioned to you that when you have the, now when Jesus gave this parable, everybody understood they lived in Israel. This was a big crop in Israel. And they knew that they only had two months once that thing got up. They had two months to get all that out and into the marketplace to get, to get their money back. Look, there, there's, in the farm business, you, if you crash a, a cash crop this year, you pull some money aside because you've got to pay labor before you get money from the crop. You've got to stash that somewhere because you've got to pay them. Then you get it in there. Then you hope the marketplace is going to hold where you can recoup your money and get enough to start next year. Man, there's where the risk is for everybody to make a living. Somebody's got to take the risk. Government don't take it. The union doesn't take it. Labor don't take the risk. Let's say everybody putting their money up. They do theirs. They get their pay right then before the product is at the market making money. You understand what I'm saying? So somebody's taking a risk. Somebody's hoping the market will hold. Somebody's hoping the prices will maintain so they can coop back, get their livelihood enough stored to start next year. As I mentioned, this all goes all the way back to Noah. And, and listen, you remember when the children of Israel came to the edge of the promised land and they sent the spies in? You remember that? You remember what they found? In the Valley of Eskel, you remember what they found? They found grapes and figs like they'd never seen ever in their life. And they said, listen, they said, truly, truly, this is a land that flows with milk and honey. It was actually, it was actually grapes and figs, but, you know, it was the principle, wasn't it? 
It was the principle. It was the principle of grace. You know what that, you know what that said to them? It said, isn't God good? Is not God good? Listen, he's already got the crops in, and, and they're crops like you've never seen. These, these are bigger, grabby, big... Don't you love that? Don't you love that? So, and, and you know what? Where Jesus is teaching this parable is in that vicinity. When he's talking about the Valley of Esco, he's talking about the Hebron area, the neighborhood of Hebron, and that's where we are. They're still raising good stuff. And listen, it's a third cash crop over there today. It's, a, it's still a land that flows with milk and honey called figs and grapes. The other thing I'd like to mention today is that God established free enterprise. The free enterprise of divine institution number two is where the source of livelihood is. You know, it's amazing to me to watch people become entrepreneurs. And my grandfather was a kid who came off of the farm went to the city and did really well, really well as a businessman in the business world. And um, chose to go back to the farm because he liked to be his own boss, just to be in control and to do these things. And he liked farming. And he, and he went back and he was a very, very good farmer. My grandfather could have been good at anything he did. Because he had a work ethic. If, you know, if you're not afraid of work, you can make a living. And it just depends on how much of that you want. But let me tell you, get it while you're young. Get it while you're young. Don't figure, well, I'll just wait until I get 60, 70, then I'll get out there and hustle and get it. Get it before then, guys. Well, anyhow... Um, the free enterprise, the free enterprise is that, now God, God has given us the land, he's given us all the stuff that we need to operate, but free enterprise is the person that's willing to risk. He finds a niche. I, my uncle and my mother both went off the farm and, and it just seemed natural for them because my grandfather always taught, always go... Always start a bit, never start a business with something you don't know because you're sure to fail. Always, always go into it. If you're going to do a business, always go into one that you know, that you're familiar with, that you have some experience with. And so my uncle and my mother both went into the restaurant business and did really well with it because they understood food. They understood how to take uh, 10 pounds of, of potatoes and figure out how much to put on one spoonful on a plate, make money. Because they understood that. They, and they had connections to it. So free enterprise is an enormous thing. And in the book of Genesis, God establishes a grace principle. For example, creation. He sets the whole thing up. Then he puts a garden of Eden in. Then he puts a man in it. And that was a whole grace principle. Then man sins, right? He eats from the tree. And then he's booted out. And now when he's booted out, he's got to work to get it. And he's got to depend on God to give him, even though he's got to work. He's got to work, sweat, and do all those things because of the curse. He still has to turn it over to God in order for it to be blessings. How, listen, how do you turn cursing into blessings? Jesus Christ. Only way is through Jesus Christ. You can't do it with, you can't say, well, I, I believe in God. That won't turn it. That won't turn it. It's okay to believe in God. That's the first step towards the right direction. But only Christ can put you into a relationship with God where God can deal with you as his own child who's precious in his sight. Right? Who's precious in his sight. And no man can come to the Father except through Jesus Christ, John 14, 6. And God is everything. In, in whether you're an employee or an employer, God, God, the name of the game is God. Your relationship with God, paying attention to what he's doing. And listen, one of the great blessings, some, listen, 
It's one thing to have a job that pays your own way. That's something you like to do. You have the freedom with it. You love to do it. And you do it. And if it, and if it gives you a good living and that's it, so be it. But what God is looking for is somebody that will be able to hire other people that God can take a business, build that business, so it can employ other people. Because idle hands are what? Devil's worship. Don't you love grandma? Huh? Buddy, grandma, grandma makes sure you learn that one. Did my grandma not make sure you learned that one? Uh -huh. My grandma made me sure I, I learned that one. Been good if she'd have taught me about Jesus, but I did get about the idle hands. All right? Now, so what God wants to do with you, if you get a little business, what he'd like to do with you, look, if you're content just to make a living, that's wonderful. That's what it's for. But what he would like to do is to bless you. What he'd like to do is to pour it through you so that you could hire and share your wealth with other people. To be generous to the livelihood of other people. To be concerned about their needs and to do those kind of things. And then God can do marvelous things through these people. That's, that's what God ultimately wants. And listen, when you, when you see a government or other agencies that fight and destroy that con concept, load them down with all kinds of things, load them down with all kinds of things that take away employment. That's a bad thing. That's not a good thing. God established it. The, the, the government would stay out of that stuff other than, uh, other than f fair wages and balances and all that kind of stuff that goes with, with the government responsibility of fair... F fair Equality of fairness on a loving playing field, we say. But to burden them down, uh, we've just gotten nuts. We're destroying. America is killing the golden goose. Uh, the, well, I don't know if it's a, it's a... The goose with the golden eggs, I guess. I don't know if it's a golden goose. I've never seen a golden goose, so I don't know. And maybe I just created one. Um, also, listen, the curse on the ground is the curse upon employment, right? You can sweat in your brown, etc. That's going to be there with the second coming of Christ, the second change. Don't let these politicians lie to you. It's there, listen, it's Romans 8th chapter, verses 20, 21. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected God, in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption. When will that be? Second coming of Christ. It, it, you're going to be under the curse of employment business till the second coming of Christ. Don't let him tell you, well, you know, if you, I, if you just elect me, I'll do this, I'll do that. No. Let me tell you. Be on your knees before God. God is the one that will do this. God will do this. These people promise you stuff they can't deliver. Look at it. They can't deliver it. How could they do that? But God can. You just need to have somebody take the, take the strangling hold away from employment. Take it away from the people who are working and, and the employees who are trying to get, the employers who are trying to get people to work. Well, anyhow. Satan has been the enemy of all five divine institutions from the very beginning. Revelation, the 12th chapter, verse 9. The great dragon, serpent, was thrown down. The serpent of old, who is called the devil, Satan, who deceives the whole world. That's recorded in John 12, 31, 14, 30, 16, 11, 1 John 5. All of that on, the, on your paper. Who deceives the whole world who was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. You remember what that is? The angelic revolt and eternity to pass. You remember that? I mean, there's your arch enemy, right? There's the arch enemy of uh, the, who's, who's out to deceive the whole world. Listen, the only people he can't deceive, listen to me, the only people he can't deceive are those who understand, read, and believe the word of God. Everybody else is a sucker. Right? He's just a sucker. He is the God of this world, which means he runs a whole system of the way we think.
Paul talked about it in, in 1 Corinthians 1, 2, and 3. Paul talks about it. He goes into great details about the God of this world's uh, system of thinking versus God's. Churches got to be careful that they don't, they don't get their head out of the word of God and get it into the world way of thinking because they just get screwed in a bed bug. The one who practices sin is of the devil in 1 John 3, 8 and 12. The devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God has appeared. Watch this. Destroy the work of the devil. You know, when he, listen. Listen to me now. This is important to your life. You know, where, you know where, where and when he did it? Listen to this. Right there. That work's already destroyed. Why is it active in your life? Because you've listened to the, you've listened, because you've allowed the devil to deceive you with the ways of the world. If you want, and listen, and you know what he's doing? He's destroying you. That's what he's after. He's after destroying you. And what you have to do is say no more. You are defeated. Your work is no longer in my life. It was destroyed with Christ on the cross. I am not a victim. I am a victor. I am an overcomer. I'm not a, you're not running over me anymore. I'm an overcomer. I'm not an undercomer. I'm an overcomer. Now, I'm not going to put up with this anymore in my life. I am through with it. Then get out of it. That work has been destroyed. Why is it active in your life? Because you've bought into a lie from the devil. He has deceived you. He's deceived you. you. Listen, and there is nothing, there is no work that he has in your life that Jesus hasn't overcome and that you can't overcome in his power. None. Whatever the devil's lied to say, well, I've got you in a death hole... You, you've got this problem. You can never break this. There is no way. I own you. I own you. He's a liar. He's a deceiver and a liar. Two things you know well about the devil from John. He is a liar and a deceiver. And you've been deceived in a lie that tells you because that work over that, he has destroyed the work of the devil, buddy. Don't let him lie to you. He, all he does is lie and deceit. Don't let them lie to you. You're an overcomer. Do not be a victim. If you have a victim's mentality, snap out of that. Get into the Word of God. Study those verses. Study. Go get your study Bible. Look in the back to the word overcomer. And read every passage on that. Find one that feeds your soul. And don't turn loose of it. You are not a victim. You're a victor. The word overcome means victor. The devil has lied to you and he's deceived you. He's told you you're a victim and you're a victim of your own, at your own hands. Well. All right. Let's have a word of prayer. We'll close down this session and open our prayer session up. We have a prayer session after this one. Let's have a word of prayer. Everybody settle down for a moment. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful tonight that we've had the opportunity to look at this parable of the kingdom of God and how it's grace and not works. The kingdom operates by grace, not by works. And if we keep thinking it's works, then we'll never understand how the last can be first and the first can be last. We can't understand. We can understand how the last could be first and that would be enjoyable. But we understand there's grumbling and griping when the first is last because there's no joy in that because it's built on a false expectation of works. God, deliver us as a church from this kind of foolishness. Get us into the kingdom thinking where it's about grace and it doesn't matter if I'm first or if I'm last. I am equal in Christ. The other is about what God is doing with my life in regard to other people. It doesn't matter if I'm standing in a line, if I'm first or last. It's, it matters 
whether or not my life is in Christ and my ministry is to others standing in the line. Help us understand these things tonight, Father, as we looked at this parable of work and wages and grace. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.